welcome everyone to uh, today's conversation, which is all about digital public infrastructures and uh, really an opportunity for our audience to um, get the latest on what's happening in digital public infrastructures, but also answer a lot of the questions around what it is, why is it useful, um, and where do we as a, as a community take it? Uh, today with me, we have uh, our guest, David Porteous, who many of you will know very, very well. David is not only the co-founder of Digital Frontiers with me, but he's also um, the founder of a new venture called Integral. And he's been on a journey for the last year uh, exploring what governance means applied in different contexts and dis different spheres, whether that's early stage company or with a sustainability or ESG and public private partnership lens. And it's within that public private partnership lens that David's interest in DPI falls uh, um, as part of Integral. Welcome, David. Uh, yeah. Very pleased to have you with us today. Um, we're gonna start off with a, a poll as we often do. Um, and if we can launch that poll, just to test with the audience, how familiar are you with DPI, right? So if you could each uh, answer those questions and we will share in a few uh, moments uh, really where we, where we stand. So please do answer that poll. There will be another two coming up in the webinar um, uh, for you to answer along the way. <clears throat> David, I see we don't get to answer. No. You're a cunt at art. <laughs> okay, great. Um, about 70% of you have responded already. Um, any more responses? There we go, 75. Let's try to push at least to 80%. <clears throat> there we go. Um, okay. Should we display those results? We see that a good 95% of you are here to learn more. Um, so 50% uh, are here starting your journey and understanding it better, which is great. Um, and then around 45% are uh, seeing it as a growing conversation, know something about it, but want to learn more. <clears throat> And only one of you are actively working on or in DPI. So that's, uh, that's an excellent outcome actually um, uh, for, for the discussion that we're about to have. Um, so with that, let me first hand over to David to give us some context, and then uh, we will jump into an audience conversation and discussion directly after that. David, over to you. Gavin, thank you. And good morning, good afternoon to everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure in so many ways to be back with this community, as you described it, Gavin. I had the chance to speak at least with some of you there, I think a year ago, and the topic then was ESG. And as you heard from Gavin's intro, that's one of the areas that I've been thinking about in the last two years. And this is the other, which has come into sharp focus in the last year, particularly the last six months. And as you'll see, there actually is a, a funny sort of tie between ESG and digital public infrastructure, or DPI, uh, as we want to talk about this morning. So here's what I suggest we just chat through to create a basis for the conversation. See if we can at least touch on these four questions, framing what we're talking about a bit. Really asking this question, so what? At least from my perspective, and I'm keen to hear yours particularly if you're already working in it, like that one person said in the poll, but even if not, then the question's about, well, what can we do about it? And in particular, as people mainly in the digital finance space, what does this look like today? So I hope we can touch on each of those four questions. But the first one really is this question about what do we mean? What is DPI? And that's where, as some of you know, I wrote a paper earlier this year, which is available with that that title, is it a useful category or just a shiny new distraction? And I'll put the link to that paper in the chat if you want to read it. 
let me just talk you through my thought process, because in some ways it frames the journey we're talking about today. So I started last year with all the buzz around DPI, starting to say, is it really useful as a term? And I quickly realized that in order to answer that, we had to be clear enough on what does it actually mean to be able to answer that first question? And that took me to, well, what does clear enough mean in the context of something that's new and relatively fast evolving? And that took me to the first takeaway I had in that paper, and I still have today, which is that as a new field, in some ways, we don't need to be too fussed about the definitions. That's why I talked about this need for an emergent definition. In other words, something which over time coheres. It doesn't have to be nailed down up front. In fact, if it were, it might limit the space for growth and change and innovation. And there's the link to ESG. ESG is another three-letter acronym, 20 years old, which still today doesn't have one single official definition, but it certainly has launched hundreds, if not thousands, of approaches to frame it, set up lists of principles, to rank it, to score it, to apply it. And underlying today's discussion is my question of, are we in the same situation just much earlier when we think about DPI? So, although there's a need for taking an emergent approach, let's try and give some content. So here's the traditional way of looking at DPI. And this picture comes from our friends at DIAL, the Digital Impact Alliance. I think it's a helpful starting point. And what it shows is the, the layer cake, or if you like, the stack, which is built on connectivity. If you don't have that, you don't have anything else in the digital space. But then on top of that, you have these three key or foundational layers that people talk about. And for some people, really, these layers are what DPI is. They're identification, they're payment infrastructure, and they're data exchange. And once you have those foundational layers, as, for example, India does today, on top of that, you can do a whole lot of interesting use cases and services. And so one definition of DPI is to say, well, really, it's those three things, and you've got to have those three things coming together. Well, yes, and, right? So what's been going on this year, in particular, in the G20, under India's leadership, India's chairing the G20 this year, and one of the unique or distinct things that they've brought to the G20 process is this emphasis on digital public infrastructure because of all India has been doing in the last 10 to 15 years in this area. And so this definition that you see there is the G20's working definition, as I understand it, not yet confirmed, probably next month uh, it'll be confirmed, but you see three components to it, a core part, so it's a set of shared digital systems, you know, you could say digital, of course, but you also know from your different course journeys that digital is not a self-evident term to define. Nonetheless, around that core definition, there are then a whole number of attributes. So it's systems which are interoperable and inclusive, secure, and now here are some of the trickier parts built on open standards, according to the G20, and they even respect fundamental human rights. Okay, and you can imagine what lies behind putting that in the definition. The most important part may be the third part, the outcomes, which is what are they there for? And so according to the G20, it's to deliver these services at scale, societal scale, in order to, and this is a really interesting part that's been recently added, drive innovation, trust, and competition. So if you like, that's one example of the state of the art in the definitional space at the moment. But as I've said to you, there's no reason to get too fussed right now. There are others. So here's another one. This is put out in the last six months by CoDevelop. CoDevelop is the new agency that has been set up, funded by the Nilekani Charities and the Gates Foundation to promote digital public infrastructure around the world. And you'll see that their definition has similar components. It has a core, it has some attributes, a little bit of difference. That's what I've put in bold there. And it comes down to, for them, digital public infrastructure is essential to participation in society and markets. 
And so what's really interesting to both definitions is we're talking about something pretty broad. It's not just about GovTech, what governments do. It's not even about infrastructure that is owned and operated by governments alone. That seems clear, but it is about infrastructure that touches the whole society and is even essential to that society. I think what's more important than having a long conversation about each of these words, which believe me has been going on in the background, is to be clear on the distinctions that you see in this picture, which comes from GovStack, the GovStack community of practice here, which talks about building blocks. So the code, the pieces of code, the algorithms, the processes, which get grouped together. Sometimes they can get grouped together in digital public goods. Those refer to the sets of code or the data, which is explicitly open source. And there is now a UN approved definition promoted by the Digital Public Goods Alliance for what a digital public good is. And so it has to be open source. It also has to be something that is in pursuit of an SDG. And there are a number of criteria. There's now a registry around these things. The point of this diagram is to say that Digital public infrastructure is not the same as a digital public good. Digital public infrastructure may be built using a digital public good, but it doesn't have to be. It could be built in other ways, although the G20 definition tends to lean towards the open standards and specifications, but note it doesn't say digital public good with the very specific definition which that has today. So, Gavin, that's really what I think we're talking about today. That's the space in which we're talking about definitions. Let's get on to the so what, right? What does this mean? Is there any usefulness in this? So as I thought about it over the last year in particular, I guess I've come to the conclusion that the term has potential value. So I'm saying potential value as a lens because I've yet to see it fully realized. But this is where I think the value lies. I think it lies if we accept that there's something going on here which isn't just about saying, well, you remember payment systems? Well, now we need to call them DPIs, right? In the same way as in the old days, Gavin, you would remember, and I'm sure on the call, many would remember, we said e-payments 10 or 15 years ago, and then all of a sudden we said, no, 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 they're actually digital payments, right? There was no change in the substance, but there was a change in the labeling, right? Probably for the better. Here, I'm arguing the value is not if this is just a relabeling of something that's already there. It's if this is a lens which puts the focus on what really is in common here across things like identification and payment systems and data sharing. And I would argue it's all about data sharing. Payments is, after all, just about transferring data that has some value attached to it. And that value might be fiat value in certain countries or certain worlds. It might be value that doesn't exist in any fiat world. It's, it's in some other world. But I see DPIs as a form of trust framework. And if we start thinking about them, whether they're payment systems, ID systems, or anything else in that form, I think it enables us to start to ask more interesting new questions. So for example, at the moment, I think the regulatory system around DPIs is hopelessly broken, hopelessly siloed. If we think of payment systems alone in a tacky regulated bucket, regulated by a payment system regulator, usually a central bank, and then you have data off somewhere else regulated sometimes by a data protection commissioner who's usually primarily concerned about privacy, you have a broken system because there's no unified view. There's no one taking a kind of utility view about how does data function in our economy? They might be saying, how do we protect it? And how do we stop it leaking and whatever? That's important. Don't get me wrong. But that's not the only use case. It's how do we use it for development in positive ways, for example. And that's where I've been excited to see some new thinking coming out of the BIS. So earlier this year, Augustine Carstens, who's the general manager of the Bank for International Settlements, gave a speech in Singapore where he started to say, what would a next generation financial market infrastructure look like in the digital economy? And what he said, and I'm going to move it to the next slide, because here you can see the, the graphic, which they now use to talk about this blueprint for a new monetary system. This is in the, the BIS's annual report that came out just last month in June. 
you can take a look at that. But what they're talking about is a new type of, I think, digital public infrastructure, for sure, where the central bank provides a CBDC as a settlement currency. It links to other forms of digital money that may be provided by banks and or others. And that unified ledger links into other types of asset registers, financial asset registers, for example, to deal with some of the real brokenness around our financial systems right now, around areas like settlement in bond markets and capital markets. And the, the BIS takes their vision much further. They talk about settlement across different value chains and cross-border, and they talk about inclusion and the ways in which this new financial market infrastructure using forms of composable algorithms on the unified infrastructure can take us so much further than we've ever been before in the silos of infrastructure as we know it. So I think that's an example of a next generation DPI. What about this one? I'm sure most of you today are, I think, I would imagine, I know Gavin is, even has a name for ChatGPT, but are using ChatGPT. So is that a digital public infrastructure operated by OpenAI, which is a private company, a rather interesting one. We could talk about its governance and, and, and the questions if you like. But if you apply that definition from co-developed, society-wide digital capability essential for participation, I think that starts to sound like ChatGPT could be a candidate DPI. I'm just going to put up one of my pet favorites, online dispute resolution. The reason I do that is because I think all of us are familiar with how the digital world today really struggles with platform domination. So all the big platforms have online dispute resolution. It's pretty sophisticated. It works pretty well if you're a customer of Amazon or eBay or one of the big ones. It's really terrible <clears throat> if you need to move to another platform. You're stuck. Your reputation is stuck. You can't take it with you. That's part of the lock-in of those platforms. And so for a while now, five years, I've been wanting to find ways to experiment with more of an open infrastructure around online dispute resolution for digital commerce that avoids that. And guess what? I want to give credit again to India. The Indian Open Network for Digital Commerce launched last year with a major report published last month. So all of this is very new. It's happening as we speak, envisages just that. It's an incredibly ambitious vision about trying to break the power of two-sided platforms and provide a central infrastructure that kind of intermediates. Will it work? I don't know, but it's one way at least of thinking about a DPI approach in the space around things like ODR. So just a few last thoughts then on the other questions. How do you govern this if your interest is governance? So most of you on this call would be familiar that, that governance has usually two components, certainly in the financial sector, external regulation, rules, laws, usually concerned about risk, and where the concern certainly we have had as digital frontiers is how do we help to support a proportional approach like in payment systems? And payment systems has been the best demonstration of a proportional approach that says, actually, until they get beyond a certain threshold, don't bother, don't even try. It's not necessarily harmful. Don't try and regulate everything. It's not going to help, it might cause more harm. So that's external regulation. There's also internal regulation, which is to say within the operator of a system, like a payment system, the board of the company is accountable for achieving the purpose of that company. Now, I think in general, you need both forms of regulation. And that's because with DPI, I think these types of failure are especially risky. So a lot of people talk about what I would call the rogue elephant scenario. So this is where you have a, a DPI that's collecting lots of data, and then it's used for a purpose which was never intended. It's used by a, an oppressive state, for example, to snoop and to do things with its citizens, which it should never be doing. That's the rogue elephant. I'm frankly as concerned about the white elephant having seen payment systems fail so often around the world, not for lack of good intent, but they become expensive, useless infrastructure that litter the landscape, which just don't work. And that's often a failure of the internal regulation, the accountability of a board management, the shareholders for just not making it work. It doesn't happen as it should. 
So what can we do in the DPI space? Well, most countries, including where I live, the United States, do not have external forms of regulation for most types of DPI. Payments is generally an exception. In areas like data exchange, there are some regulations coming in around data privacy, but there's nothing which sees the whole as more than the sum of its parts. We see some interesting moves, like some of you would have followed the White House's uh, recent voluntary framework, where it got together the world's biggest AI companies, at least the US ones, and got them to agree to a voluntary framework. That was two weeks ago. And so they've agreed to some principles. Those of you who've been on courses, like um, some of the CIDM ones, would know that self-regulation is fine to a point. But the problem is that what about the hundreds of other companies that don't follow that, right? That doesn't help. So we need to think beyond simple self-regulation. And for me, at least, I think in the absence of state regulation in these areas, donors and investors in these type of areas can play a stronger role. And they can do it by insisting on a strong accountability-driven purpose. And we could talk more about this if you're interested. I think there should be ombuds frameworks that help to keep operators, chat GPT as operator open AI, payment system operators accountable for their purpose fulfillment. Finally, so many of you are practitioners in digital finance today. What does DPI mean for you? Well, clearly, as I've said, it's about moving beyond these silos of, okay, so you're a payment expert. It's now saying, well, actually, DPI is about saying, really, data is data, and it's going to manifest in different forms. And yes, there will be specializations around those forms. But actually, there's a need to start to build an integrated understanding across the layers of the stack, not only within one layer of the stack. I wonder, Gavin, whether there won't be a future profession like a DPI engineer, someone who is skilled at designing for what it looks like across the silos to exploit the advantages that come when you really can put these pieces together in a new way. And that's why I would say for you DFI practitioners, take the, what I would call the Costins challenge, which is what does it look like to build that unified ledger, which the BIS is talking about today? And which, by the way, I know in certain parts of the world, there are people working on parts of that. It's not like it's in the future. It's already here. It's just not here fully in complete form today. So finally, I would say back to that linkage I made at the beginning. ESG, 20 years ago, acronym, just words, but words which were powerful enough to launch a thousand ships with a lot of energy, a lot of heat. Sometimes in recent years, especially in the United States, more heat than light in the whole controversy around what ESG really means. Around DPI, I think there is energy in the words. I think there could be content in them, which makes them really useful for some of the purposes, which is why you've signed up for the courses and for the work that you do in your professional lives. And my hope is it's people like you who will be part of a journey of making that reality where DPI does contribute to building infrastructure, which is essential and helpful for an inclusive and thriving digital economy in the future. So I hope those thoughts help to frame our conversation today. Gavin, back to you. Thank you, David. Um, excellent and uh, informative as always. I have uh, a few questions. I also see there's already a question in the Q&A, but perhaps let's launch our second poll first and let's see um, what that asks of us. So based on what you've just learned, which of these are DPIs? Pick one or more that apply. Well, I see we've got it as single choice. So just pick one. Um, that you feel uh, is a DPI. Very interesting. I can see we have many alumni <laughs> in the meeting answering this question. Uh, let's wait for a few more responses. And then David, I'll perhaps pass to you for your views on these three as a DPI. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, 
couple more. Let's just get it to that 80% mark. <clears throat> and there we go. Uh, Zanska, could you share? Okay, so there we see that a third think Visa and Mastercard global payment systems could be digital public infrastructures. Uh, two thirds that uh, ADA, India's unique digital ID system, uh, could be a digital public infrastructure. And very few that feel MPESA uh, could be a, a digital public uh, infrastructure. Uh, your thoughts, David? Well, I think really interesting. Yeah, and it would have been interesting if we'd been able to give people a multiple choice, right? And to see how that might have turned out, right? Because I think the answer is that DPI is a spectrum. And in some ways, the uh, intensity of voting there shows a kind of spectrum of features, right? So I think that most people would agree that ADAR, India's ID system, operated by UIDAI is pretty safe harbor, right? There aren't many people who would say that's not a form of DPI. It's part of the India stack, it's fun, right? I would agree with those who would say Visa and MasterCard qualify. You know, if you look at those definitions about essential for participation in a, in a digital society and so on, yeah, I think, I think you'd have to say that they qualify. Visa and MasterCard operate payment systems. And to be clear, the DPI is not Visa. Visa is the operator, but the payment system, which is what this says, is a DPI. So I would I would be with those who, who would put count them in. Then Impesa. So that's an interesting one and a tougher one, right, Kevin, as you know, because we've debated this sometimes in class, which is that is Impesa really a payment service or a payment system, right? So the difference between M-Pesa and Visa and MasterCard is, of course, the multilateral nature of Visa and MasterCard, right? They have multiple players that can be acquired on different sides of their platform, whereas M-Pesa is the central service provider. Now, of course, M-Pesa has evolved. And if we were simply to apply the essential for participation, well, any Kenyan on this call would say, come on, of course, it's essential for participation in society today. If we were to get technical about what is a infrastructure, a financial infrastructure, and apply the BIS CPMI definition about that, one might say, well, actually, it's more of a service than a system, but we'd be getting pretty technical about it. So I would prefer, Gavin, to say we've got a, we've got a spectrum here. And actually, if we stress this essential to participation thing, yeah, there's a good case to make that all three might be, one certainly is, one likely is Visa MasterCard, and one there's a case to be made. Mm. Especially, you know, I was interested in the, the low votes on um, M-Pesa. Um, and I, because it's gone so far as enabling other things other than its own payment service. So whether it's, access to micro instances of renewable energy or uh, unlocking of utilities through, uh, uh, through payments, et cetera. So the ecosystem and innovation that it's enabled around it, it could well qualify um, as, a, as, a D, uh, as, as a DPI. Yeah, we, yeah I think you're right. Some, yeah, go for it. Sorry, David. No, just to say, I think I think one of the tests for me of infrastructure really is, yeah, the multilateral thing is then operator. Those are the BIS tests. But I think it is that test of, can you do something on top of it, which it wasn't necessarily explicitly designed to do, right? I mean, like a road, right? There's a road. I can drive my car in it, but you can drive your tank down the road as well if you choose to, right? Right. Um Let's go to the questions, David. Uh, first, in the, uh, the Q&A forum there, we have Amitab uh, asking, so can we say DPI refers to the foundational digital infrastructure provided by governments or public entities that enables the functioning and growth of digital services and applications? Well, so it sounds like Amitab um, has been part of maybe part of the discussion which has gone on because that definition definitely reflects some of the elements you've seen that are emerging in the one definition I, I showed you, the G21. But you can see the difference, Amitabh, in what you're suggesting there, provided by governments. Uh, now, I don't know what you mean by public entities. I guess that to me would be the test. Um, the G20 definition 
doesn't say who has to provide it. It does talk about what it has to look like, you know, those attributes that it has to have, open source and things like that. Um, the co-develop definition starts about starts to talk about things like locally sovereign, you know, so they all start to have inflections around what they mean by public. And so mm -hmm. I guess I would say, Gavin, that if Amitabh is, is willing to embrace a, a sense of public, which is pretty broad, right? I mean, for example, Visa and MasterCard, they are public companies, right? What does that mean? It means they're listed on stock exchanges. It means they're accountable to certain things. I guess that's where the interesting discussion for me is, not about is it government provided or not, because frankly, in the future, I don't think many governments will be able to do what India has done. And I think it's going to be around um, how do we put that public overlay, so maybe public entities, which keep these things on track. Right. So it's more public uh, sector governance or government governance um, layers, perhaps, uh, than necessarily having um, government ownership um, uh, and operating uh, the, the, uh, uh, the DPIs. Did, I think so. Jack Jackson, Jackson is asking, apart from India, do we have another successful country that has implemented DPI? Yeah, so what's happening right now, Jackson, is there are a lot of search going on from a lot of different bilateral, multilateral bodies looking for case studies. Right. And I think what's happening is a lot of individual case studies can be found of how this country has done that with its payment system. And we know coming out of COVID in particular, there was a lot of acceleration of things like G2P, social transfer solutions. And people are using those as examples of a DPI application. Frankly, though, if we really think about the DPI as being a set of digital systems, things that somehow work together to share data in ways which make that whole, that cake, if you like, in that picture, more than the sum of the parts, I don't think there are many examples like that. You know, the other example, which people do talk about a lot, is Estonia, right? So literally the other end of the, the country scale from India. So India, the world's largest country in population, Estonia, one of the world's smallest countries in population, but where they have a functioning stack which, Gavin, as you know, in our ID courses, we talk about in particular, but not just that, in data exchange. Um, Estonia's X-Road system is now being used in a number of countries, including, you know, not just in Scandinavia, it's being used in Namibia now, for example, right. as a way of enabling data exchange. So I would say those are the two purest country examples, and there are others that are probably on the road, and I would love to hear about others that have got the, the ability of working across the layers going, which I think is the real secret source. Right. Adding, adding, adding to this, um, pushing the, the definition around, is DPI public sector offered, controlled, government offered, operated, etc. Beatrice is saying, shouldn't a characteristic of a DPI be non-profit? Uh, with a free entrance fee, which I thought was interesting. And then just, again, pushing the definitions. Farhad is asking, would blockchain and distributed technology be an integral part of DPI? Uh, just before I go to his more um, uh, pushing the envelope question there. So what do you think, David? Uh, should DPIs be nonprofits? Is blockchain and distributed technology an integral part? Yeah, those are great questions. So thank you, Beatrice and Farhad. You know, should a DPI be nonprofit? I would say not necessarily, right? I would say not necessarily if there were a regulatory framework around it. And here's my argument. And that is that in a number of parts of the world, infrastructure, and here I'm not thinking digital, I'm just thinking electricity, water, things like that, are actually provided by private companies. Now, there have been some major disasters, right? The UK is one of them recently around water, which they privatized and they're having all sorts of issues. To me, that doesn't take away the case to say, at least allow for the possibility that some of those utilities don't have to be government run. And Gavin, looking at you there, living in South Africa, you know, I don't need to make the case that a state-owned electrical utility is not an optimal solution always for providing something really essential, not just for digital society, but for society as a whole, electricity, right? We, right. we have a real problem in South Africa with a not-for-profit state-owned utility doing it. 
So I would at least argue, Patrice, to say we shouldn't restrict it to nonprofit. I think there are definitely advantages in having operators of certain DPIs that are nonprofit. So I absolutely agree with that. There are advantages and that can manage, therefore, in a different way. That's the model of NPCI in India. Even the Indian Open Network on Digital Commerce that I just cited started last year. It's a Section 8 company, not-for-profit company in India. The issue with those, of course, is they're very hard to fund. And if you look yeah. at OpenAI, Gavin, they're not a not-for-profit company. They started as that. And then they right. said, do this OpenAI thing. Um, we need tons of capital to pay for cloud computing resources that are incredible. And so instead, what they adopted is a for-profit model linked to a nonprofit, and they capped the return. So I don't say that to say that's the final solution. I just say that's an example of something which I think is interesting to look at. The public part to me is about the oversight. And if it's not going to come from regulation, then it has to come from somewhere else. And that's where I'd say the donors, the investors, the funders need to put in place the strong protections. Right. And answer to Fahad, you know, I, yeah. Fahad, absolutely. I think there is, and you would be, I think if you haven't looked at the BIS paper, that's they're talking about forms of distributed ledger because of the capabilities that that gives to advance the trust environment beyond the current kind of lagged payment delivery environment, which just is, it's just not optimal. We've accepted it for a long time, but we can move beyond it. So Fahad, I hope that you, with your interests that I know about and the solutions you're working on, you can be part of taking that cost challenge because I do think distributed ledger technology and these universal ledgers is absolutely a part of DPI. It's not all of it, by the way, it's a part. It's a way in which DPIs can function. Yeah, David, you know, again, pushing this out to the how much we can imagine uh, this or how far we can imagine this to go is far second part of his question, which is, do you see spatial computing? So that's core to, I'm not sure if you saw the reason Apple iVision Pro launch um, uh, this year. So spatial computing, you know, could this become a digital public infrastructure, I suppose, or digital public good? Does Apple products, uh, are they digital public goods? Is Google uh, uh, a digital public uh, good, right? So all of these things do impact the digital economy and society. Um, and so, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, just pushing the, 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 pushing the envelope of private sector provided digital public assets? Yeah. Well, so I don't know specifically what that Apple, um, the, the recent Apple launch is, but it's, I get the general um, drift of it. So I do think there's a vast domain of areas in which there can be forms of public-private provision, right? So as you said, Gavin, in the introduction, that's an area that I find really interesting because I think it's really important where there is a blend of public and private approaches to deliver effectively on infrastructure. You know, that's happened with roads and bridges and toll roads and things like that because Governments have not proved up to the challenge in many places. Um, so I think we will see more of that. On the spatial part, one of the things I've been fascinated, I've been learning more in the last six months about that specifically, because there's an example of how, you know, the GPS system, as most of you know, came out of a project for the US military, right? That put up the satellites that created this initial positioning um, system on which so much has been built. Now we have others building private systems, right, including Apple, and maybe that's what it's being referred to. But we also have people like Place. Place is a nonprofit entity based in Washington, a spin-off from the Omidyar network, which is seeking for developing countries to offer public open source maps of their cities built on using the kind of detailed remapping that has to be done off the basic, you know, GPS footprint. I think that is essential digital public infrastructure for this next generation, because we all know that the digital, we don't just live in cyberspace, we live in cities and countries with right, right. real boundaries and roads and power cables that get cut and things like that. And so I do think there's going to be a lot of development in that space. Right. So then jumping back down into the detail, because you do have these, you know, future tensions or maybe current tensions moving between is this private infrastructure offered as public good? Is it public infrastructure offered 
for public good and private sector utilization, um, uh, et cetera. So it does you know, circle back to these governance questions. And I see Quinton, between Quinton, Amitab, and even Kambe are asking more detailed governance questions here. First of all, Quinton is saying, how do you see geopolitical interests or tensions between countries and regions affecting the DPI space? He gives an example of the European Central Banking largely targeting at CBDC at replacing MasterCard or Visa in its communication. So they're geopolitical interests, government versus um, uh, large um, you know, global providers of digital public goods, right? Um, and then uh, Amitabh is talking about um, you know, how much of a challenge or perhaps opportunity uh, will uh, interagency coordination, regulation, and the complexity uh, around data privacy and security uh, cause uh, in the case of DPI. And uh, Combi uh, is, is referring to global standards, protocols, or open source standards to foster international uh, cooperation, allow for much needed interoperability amongst DPI. So there, you can see this jump between local issues, global issues, public sector uh, or even government ownership operation and offering against global multinationals offering, you know, private private offering uh, and negotiations. And, you know, where will it land? That's quite a complex bag of goods. Yeah, it really is, Gavin. And, you know, those questions are great questions, which to me indicate how this community, this community of people with those backgrounds and particulars, um, like Quentin, like Fahad, like Kombe, uh, and, and Beatrice, uh, they all, I think, have a contribution to make to what is very much a moving target right now. So to pick up Quentin's point about the geopolitical tensions, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the DPI debate plays right into the heart of those of you who've done the IDED, the Introduction to Digital Economic Development course that we put together a few years ago, would know that there are these three kind of dominant views of the world and DPI is like the thing that cuts into them, right? So there's the, the kind of American view of the world, which has traditionally been laissez-faire, just let it happen and see what happens. And if it gets bad, do something about it, right? And this voluntary pact is kind of the recent one with the Biden administration is kind of in, in direction of that, although this country is starting to get more activist as well. The opposite of that has been the Chinese approach, which is that digital public infrastructure is very much there in the state interest. It's to be used as such, uh, et cetera, and uh, treated that way. And apparently in the G20 discussions, part of that definition that's evolved started with the American side actually being very opposed to even the idea of digital public infrastructure, because it violates the idea that it could all be freely privately provided if need be. Apparently that's changed. But what they've insisted on with the Europeans, now that's the third view, which is the rights-based view. And that's why the Europeans have led the world in the regulation of the digital space in so many ways. But the European, um, the, the American view and the, the Chinese view intention, the European view has come into that definition, you'll see, you know, where it talks about for promoting human rights and things like that as, as part of the rider in the definition. So we very much see the tensions playing out there. No question uh, about that. Um, you asked about, uh, was it Com oh, about the uh, Combe's question, the cross-border standards. I can see that yeah. here in the chat. I'm missing, there was one in between, wasn't there, Gavin? I'm missing. Um, Dr. You've Quentin? Covered it. Have I? Okay. Yes, you covered it. Okay. So with Combe, absolutely. I think the, the global standard discussion is a very important one right now because those global standards do have force. And so what I think you all know is happening is in digital ID, there are those discussions happening about using standards, open source standards like those promoted by MOSIP, for example, out of India, built on UIDAI's experience, or in payments, you know, Mojo Loop is an example. Now, Mojo Loop, we haven't seen yet a lot of traction. MOSIP, I believe there's much more traction around those things. But I do think that that discussion around standards at the protocol level is necessary and helpful. So I do think having the likes of the CPMI in payments, the Committee on Payment Market Infrastructure, is helpful. And we don't have the equivalent in this broader DPI space. 
I think it's one of the things that's lacking. And so the G20 at the moment is obviously it's not that. It's a discussion forum which will change. You know, next year Brazil is the chair. So there'll be different issues probably on the table. But there is a need for something that would fill that gap to talk through those standards beyond just payments or beyond just data privacy alone. Great, David, there's one more question in the chat, but uh, I think it might be related to our, our next poll. So I wonder in the last 10 minutes that we have, let's launch that poll and just talk about why the need. So anonymous attendee, uh, your question's noted, I'll come back to it. So if there were a course on DPI, would you be interested in taking it as the poll? But I'm interested in also opening, uh, you know, uh, opening the voice channels after the poll if uh, you don't want to type in the text etc for the audience to talk about you know is there a need for creating capabilities around a, an emerging dpi profession right or a dpi you know almost like our certified digital finance practitioner certified digital um dpi practitioner right <laughs> digital public infrastructure pr practitioner. So for the audience to think about that, and I think uh, I'm hoping anonymous attendees question uh, there uh, is about that. What is Digital Frontiers Institute doing about this? You know, how do we bring this to local contexts like Malawi, where we can stimulate um, DPI solutions uh, in local contexts? So let's give, our, we're at 65% on the poll. Let's Push for a few more responses. Okay, just a couple more until we have 80%. But oh, there we go. Um, okay, so if we can end that poll and share the results. So there you see. Um, 73% are saying, yes, this is essential. 24% are saying, maybe, uh, I think it would help build the capacity to advocate for it. And uh, one participant is saying, no, I think I have enough information for now, which I'm hoping is the participant that's working in that space. Uh, great, so there does seem to be a need, perhaps for a course or, or even based on the complexity of the questions that, um, uh, that we received today, David, a lot on um, a lot on um, policy regulation in the space and all of the unknowns. A lot of I'm hearing a lot on the business of DPI. Is this public sector provided, operated? Is it private sector provided, operated? Is it localized, sovereign? Is it enabled by global participants, global private sector? There's a lot there. So it seems clear that uh, uh, you know perhaps some form of capacity building uh, around DPI, maybe even just to get that definition stage that you're talking about or that standardized language and understanding across the board is needed. I'm gonna to open to any of the attendees to have this conversation with us. So if any of you have views, please uh, do, I see Farhad. Um, I just wanna check with our, uh, with Zanska that we are, uh, we've opened the floor. Go for it, Fahad. Hi, hi, David, again, Kevin. Lovely to see you again. Uh, just a great, uh, excellent session. Uh, for me, uh, I have been studying this topic, uh, and uh, I think uh, this has lots of demand, especially when we define uh, D, uh, DPI, uh, and it it's needs to be interoperable, inclusive. It's connected to in the digital economy as well. So it covers public as well as private. So the, we, the, this is the best thing about it. That's why public-private partnership and DFI being a, a capacity building organization, it will, uh, it will not only encourage uh, from the banking sector, which we traditionally serve, or a telco sector, but in this uh, DPG uh, you know, practitioner course or you know, a complete line of courses, we can also um, um, engage other other uh, multinationals, uh, other verticals like gaming, for example, gaming. Uh, so being in in the in the crypto payments world right now, so I can see that two two more segments have appeared. 
in my repertoire gaming and forex so that's why i think uh, dpi under the label dpi or dpg uh, dfi uh, has a great potential to offer excellent courses amita before you respond david let's check with amita thanks fad can you hear me Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, okay. I am from Bangladesh, and I have a query in uh, as, uh, to me, uh, regarding the challenges or scopes as we talked, as I mentioned earlier. In Bangladesh, there are significant dis disparities in digital access and literacy between the urban and rural areas. The first point is that, and the second point is that. The ensuring data security and privacy is a critical concern till now, and the regulatory framework it's a, it's at the level of development, a clear uh, and adaptive regulatory framework for DPI in Bangladesh or uh, for digital payment in Bangladesh. Uh, infrastructure development is also. Uh, we are expanding the digital infrastructure. So uh, do you think in this situation, what can be the challenges and what can be the scopes for Bangladesh? If, if you want me to be specific, that is there is scopes for Bangladesh to work free government services or uh, digital health services for DPI or agriculture and rural development uh, DPI. I think uh, I have not much or made you confused. Gavin, you're on mute. Thanks, Amita. Uh, let's uh, one more from Kombi and then we give David the opportunity to uh, respond. Kombi? Okay, I think, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a very good presentation. And for me, uh, it's it's around what's been happening the last decade and a half and the evolution that's going on in terms of um, you know just the whole landscape of uh, uh, of essential infrastructure and I think uh, from from um, David's presentation the classic example is um, what's happening in, in in India and I think for India it's because of the willpower for the government to have a long term vision to implement that. In other developed economies like the U.S. or the, or the United Kingdom, you know, they're, they're dealing with they're still dealing with legacy infrastructure, which they have to to live through. Developing economies, it's a whole lot different, and I think that's why uh, Kenya and and the Impesa case has has really really uh, you know uh, evolved because the use case is there. But but for me, I see it in terms of long term, which will take a lot of you know government commitments. It has to be pu public and private partnership, but there has to be Willing, willingness for, from, from governments to, to implement uh, 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 this infrastructure. Uh, because you know it's, it becomes a public good and, and we've seen the push even from when the internet started. We're still talking about the internet being you know, a right, but, but in different jurisdictions, the level of development, the level of uptake is, is, is pretty different. So for me, the landscape is, is, is huge, but the development continues. Yes, mm. in terms of uh, international standard, setting bodies, uh, a push from the United Nations, the UN, if we have those as basic rights, ideally you have governments committing to that at that higher level and then being held accountable to try and implement it in their local jurisdictions. So for me, it, 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 it has to be you know, that global push from everybody. But I think the bigger standard setting bodies like the United Nations, and, and if you have deliberate policies like that, and then you see such push then we'll, we'll talk about, uh, you know, a jurisdiction or regional integration. And then most definitely what we're hoping for, uh, for global interoperability and allowing, uh, 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 you know, for improving of lives of the citizens. So for me, it's, it's broader than that. And I think it's, it's, it's more long term than, uh, uh, than it being implemented now, but ultimately depends on different jurisdiction, different governments, but hoping for a push from global uh, uh, institutions. That's my contribution. Thank you. Hmm. Thanks, Kambi. David, some responses, and then perhaps just a closing in the three minutes that we have there. Um, go for it. 
Sure, yeah. Well, Gavin, thank you. And and thank you, uh, Amitabh Fahad Kombe. Those are all really interesting and thoughtful questions. And they really do, I think, make the point I made earlier, which is this community is a community of people who have had conversations around aspects of this. As you've all been saying, you have opinions. You're part of this discussion. I want to encourage more of that. Here's one element I do want to pick up on, which touches a little bit on, on Amitabh's point when he was talking about infrastructure disparities between rural and urban Bangladesh, for example. You know, what's interesting to me is that that con connectivity layer that is at the bottom of the cake or the pyramid, right, in most countries around the world has been provided by whom? MNOs, right? And MNOs, most of them are privately owned, right? But they have been subject to public oversight in the way they provide the infrastructure. So in Bangladesh, I'm sure, Amitabh, there they would be subject to connectivity or access protocols as to coverage, for example. They're subject to pricing regulation in many places, right? I think those are in general good things. So I hold out for the world in which the kind of utility model around this will prevail. I hold out for that because I don't have a lot of faith that there are many governments in the world, perhaps outside of India and a few other places, which can actually do this because it's complex to get these bigger picture things together. And so, Kombe, I share your hope that the international discussion on protocols will help us advance. I hope it will. But in the meanwhile, I would say to each of you, I think the best way all of us can be equipped is to develop the language, to have the conversations. And back to the course question, Gavin, obviously this is so much beyond just a course, right? But it is about language. And that's what we've always sought to do with our courses, right? Is to, is to help people join a conversation, not to try and come up with a new definition. People have definitions and standard setters make definitions, but people need to be able to be in a conversation. And this is a live conversation. It's an important conversation. I think it's potentially a fruitful one. So I hope that all of you will be part of it as it goes forward. Great, thank you, David, as always, for a, an incredible uh, conversation. And thank you to the audience for making it uh, easy for us to facilitate and to talk with uh, deep, meaningful, questions. Um, we will share this uh, webinar uh, publicly, so if you want to uh, uh, refer back to it in the near future, it'll be out in a few days' time. Look out for it and keep having conversations about digital public infrastructure and their, their relevance. We're looking forward to working with you all on, uh, on this topic in, in future. David, thank you for your time. Zanska, thank you for the facilitation and audience. Thank you very much for making it worthwhile. Bye-bye, everyone. Great to be with you. Bye-bye.